Well, I wonder whether you feel like praising God this evening. I wonder if you're, as they might say, in the mood. Are you in the mood to worship? Perhaps you are in the grip of affliction, trial, tribulation. Perhaps you're undergoing pressures that are squeezing you tight and sapping you of all joy and vitality to the point where you say, I've got nothing left. I, I, I'm here because you're a good, dutiful Christian. And duty is not a dirty word in this place, dear friends. Um, it, 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 duty can keep you in the place where you need to be when you don't feel like it. And that is very important to remember. There are some churches and Christians today that almost imply that you shouldn't do the right thing if you don't feel like doing the right thing because that doesn't honour God. Well, dear friends, it's still better to be here than not be here at all. So duty is a good word, but, but, it, but it can sap you and you're here and you're here by duty and you've been coming, but you're just not in the mood. Peace has given way to unrest. Strength has, has given way to weariness. Energy has been sapped. You have a heavy heart as opposed to a light heart. Your heart is troubled as opposed to quiet. And you say to me, Pastor, how can I praise when I feel like this? I may have said this before, but um, the opening line in the churches where I met my dear wife by the minister was this. Good morning, folks. How are you all feeling? I'll be sitting there. Don't ask me how I'm feeling. I had an argument with my wife in the car. I, I bumped the car on the curve. I got a ticket. I mean, you know, you, you could have... Um, some of those things I'm making up, but you get the point. Sometimes, you know, don't ask me how I feel, because if you ask me how I feel, I feel even less like worshipping. Tell me who God is. Then ask me how I feel. Sometimes we don't feel like worshipping, do we? Sometimes our body is here, but our heart is somewhere else. And, and you say, look, when my circumstances change, then I will praise God. Then I will get back to the way things were. Problem is, there might also be people here who feel exactly the way you do, and they're in the best circumstances of all. Having blessed earthly circumstances can sometimes be the most sapping of spiritual joy. Because sometimes the more we have, the more at peace we are, the more content we are, when everything seems to be going tickety-boo, as they say, um, sometimes that is when we feel most spiritually numb. Because we start to seek satisfaction in the things of this world and comforts in the things of this world. And there's no, our heart is so full of the wrong things, not of God. And so we come into the house of God and everything externally in our life is fine, but actually it's not fine. And people are talking about the Lord, but your mind is on other things. And there's a dullness in worship. It was said of Israel many times, wasn't it, that they forgot their Lord and they asked certain things of God and the Lord gave them what they wanted. And there's a text in the psalm which says, and he put a leanness into their souls. In other words, he, 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 they, had, they had a reduced capacity to know joy and, 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 and the blessings that God alone can give. Maybe there are some broken heart, broken-hearted servants here. You've been faithful for many years. You've tried to fear God, keep his commandments. But somewhere along the way, you became weary of the work. Now, it's been said, hasn't it, that we should be weary in the work, but not of the work. But truth is, sometimes we're just weary of the work. Maybe you can relate to this feeling. You're like Elijah. You want to tap out. just want a sabbatical. But perhaps you're not a believer here this evening. Praise God! Maybe someone's listening in. Why should I praise God? Do you know what's happened in my life this week? Do you know the suffering that I've been through? Who do you think you are? Praise God. Do you know the phone call that I had this week? Worship him. There can be all sorts of reasons, can't there? Why we don't feel like praising God. And the danger is, when we slip into that posture or that condition, we become passive and we just say, well, it will only change when God does something about it. And that is a very, very dangerous place to be. Somehow we think it's not my fault. I need the Lord to zap me. And then I will praise 
God. Or when my circumstances change, then I will praise God. Or when God does what I want him to do, then I will praise God. What we're going to see in this psalm, this evening, I don't know how far we're going to get. Oh, just as a confession, forgive me if I'm not as easy to follow tonight. I've had problems with my internet and my notes are completely messed up. I've had different files saved at different times. and I've had to sort of scramble it together and put it together. So I'm do, I'll do my best, Lord, helping me this evening to be coherent and, and to be someone you can follow. Um, anyway, back to where we were. What we will see from David is that he does not take his spiritual condition as something he can just accept. He summons himself. He, indeed, in strong language, he, he commands himself. He, I know we're reformed and we love the sovereignty of God and we say that apart from him we can do nothing. But we abuse those doctrines and that teaching when we neglect the responsibility to, as Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones would say, take yourself in hand. And so that's my first point this evening. We are summoned to praise God. Now, I do believe, and I hope you'd agree, that the Psalms are ordered purposefully. That the Holy Spirit in his wisdom, and even those who collated them and put them together under the direction of the Spirit, were organising them very well. Now, I don't think it's a coincidence, then, that Psalm 103 follows on from Psalm 102. I'm not going to read the whole Psalm, but if you turn back to Psalm 102, look how it's headed in our version. A prayer of the afflicted. When he, pour, when, he, when he is overwhelmed and pours out his complaint before the Lord. So David is an afflicted man. He's in trouble, verse 2. He describes a withered heart in verse 4. So stricken is his heart, so withered like the grass. He's lost the ability to love and to feel and to enjoy. He's isolated, verse 6. I'm like a pelican in the wilderness. Have you ever been there before? No one knows what I'm going for. I'm going, I'm all alone. I'm bearing this all alone. He has insomnia. Maybe some of you have known what it's like to have insomnia. Verse 7, I lie awake. He's opposed in verse 8. He has enemies. He's disciplined. Verse 10, because of your indignation and your wrath. You, listen to this language. You have lifted me up and cast me away. Maybe you felt like that at times in your life. You can look back and say, the Lord lifted me up, the Lord was kind to me, and then it's like he just disposed of me, and he was no longer being to me as he was to me. So that that is the context. That that is what David is going through. And therefore, it's not a coincidence that he opens Psalm 103 in that kind of condition and says, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits. David is saying, I can't. Allow what I'm going through in my afflictions and my circumstances to rob God of his praise and his glory. I will praise God. I will worship God. He is reprimanding himself. Humanly, humanly, he has every reason to feel miserable. And I'm sure many of you do. But David does not believe that his circumstances mean there is nothing left to praise God for. Notice the word bless comes up three times in verses 1 to 2. Bless the Lord. Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord. He stirs himself up to praise God. Here we see, this is why this is a teaching message tonight. Here we see the way out of spiritual depression. And notice there, I've qualified it spiritual depression. I am not talking about depression that is caused through physiological and biological factors and those kind of elements. That's not my topic tonight. I'm talking about depression that is caused partly because of the Lord's dealings with you, circumstances, and it causes a spiritual flatness and a dullness and a leanness of heart. And he here models the way out of such a condition. And is this. Praise. But I don't feel like praise. Praise. Um, one of the early influences on me as a, as a Christian was a man by the name of Terry Virgo. I, I, I don't agree with a lot of the things he teaches actually now, but he came up with some helpful nuggets from time to time. And one of the things he said that I found helpful as a new Christian was, pray yourself into prayer. Right? And I think what he was getting at there is, you don't feel like praying, but you pray until all of a sudden, the, 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 bottle, the lid is off the bottle, and the heart can find itself gushing out. Start screwing the lid. Start the process. And, uh, you know, we sing the hymn, don't we? If you wait until you're better, 
you will never get better at all. That was true before you were saved and it has never stopped being true. You never get better by keeping yourself at a distance from God, do you? And David therefore understands that the only way for him to have a heart that is restored in a sense of marvel at the enjoyments of knowing his God is actually to go to God. It's to go to God. Bless the Lord. He puts the Lord front and centre in his horizon. Forget not all his benefits. Now let's be clear what this isn't. What this isn't. This is not some uh, mindless whipping our souls up into a frenzy through repetitive choruses. Some of you have known that maybe. This is not um, going to the latest uh, Getty conference or um, Keswick conference or wherever it is where the music just makes you feel in a really good mood. This is not what it is. This, This is not getting your worship feet. This is not... Because unbelievers can do that, can't they? Uh, unbelievers can, can wake up in the morning, feel really depressed and put on their favourite song on the radio and they can just feel slightly... I mean, I, it's true for me. I can put on... A, there's, I, there's pieces of music, classical pieces of music, I can put on, it'll make me cry. Yeah. Sometimes when I'm struggling with, with sermon preparation, I'll put on a great uh, a military soundtrack or something and it makes me feel like in the mood. To do spiritual warfare and to, to wrestle. and um, Music is powerful. This is not what he's saying. No, no. This is not something the natural man can do. This is not a mood lift. So what is it? It is putting before you the greatness of God. Bless the Lord. He is immediately confronting himself and forcing himself to be confronted with the person, the character, the nature and the glory of the tri- triune God. Now that requires effort and this is why so few people don't want to do this. And especially if you're feeling tired, which we so often are, it's even harder to do. That's why it's called a sacrifice of praise. You, you, you actually have to labour Uh, to do this but the fruit and the rewards are well worth the trouble dear friends because if you wait if you stay away you will never get better at all it is in going to God that we get better and it is as we engage our hearts and minds on the person of the Lord as he's revealed to us in the son of God it is then that we find joy arise within us this impacts how we worship doesn't it do you not agree the content of what we sing matters more than the style of how we sing what we sing. I'm not saying tunes are irrelevant. There are some tunes in our hymn book that I do wish they would redo some new tunes. They're a bit of a dirge and I just feel miserable after singing it. <laughs> you know? um, but what I'm saying is, is David is telling us that the way we have our spirit, our souls lifted, not our animal spirits, but our soul, is through contemplating the person of the Lord. And therefore, what we need in our hymns is hymns that are full of the Lord, full of who he is, full of what he has done, full of his accomplishments. And it's so often in that, as we focus our hearts and minds on the person, the glory of the Lord, that our affections are inflamed. Now, what does this teach us? What does David reprimanding himself teach us? Well, it teaches us this, that praise doesn't come naturally. Praise doesn't come naturally. Praise has to be awakened in us. Now, I know some people have like a a very sort of um, um, poetic fairy tale view of the pulpit and the ministry that, you know, your preachers always come into their pulpits just skipping from the study, singing psalms, hymns and spiritual songs. That wasn't how I came into the study this morning. There's a few dirty nappies on the way, and among other things. Sometimes, you know, I come to church, speaking for myself, and it's only in the act of worshipping that I encounter the Lord. And the Lord comes, and the Lord is good. But, but you know, if, if, I, if I measured what God was going to do by how I was feeling on the way, you know, 
I could have been quite discouraged. Now we have to awaken praise in us for a number of reasons. Primarily because we're prone to forget the reasons that we should praise God. Uh, Psalm 106, just a few psalms along. Verses um, 8. The Lord says, He saved them, that is Israel, for his name's sake, that he might make his mighty power known. Then he goes on to describe all the great things he did, the, the splitting of the Red Sea, leading them through the wilderness. Um, Verse 12, they believed his words, they sang his praise. So at the time, at the moment, they praised him. They were overwhelmed by the goodness of their God. But what happens very soon after, verse 13, they soon forgot his works. They did not wait for his counsel. And here is that verse I've been referring you to. But lusted exceedingly in the wilderness and God tested and tested God in the desert. And he gave them their request, but sent leanness into their soul. So they forgot God and they wanted something other than God. Adversity, so that's forgetfulness. Another reason we struggle to praise God is actually adversity, and that was how I began with our introduction. Adversity can, um, and it's something that, you know, all those who minister, you've ever ministered a Bible study, don't always be overly discouraged if it seems that people just aren't in the mood. Um, because adversity and pressure can sometimes um, make people so heavy that they just can't enter into what's being said. Um, Exodus 6, verse 8 and 9, this great promise, I will bring you into the land. This is what Israel been waiting for, which I swore to Abraham, Isaac and Jacob. I will give it to you as an inheritance. I am the Lord. This should have thrilled them. They should have been doing cartwheels. They should have been celebrating. The tambourine should have been out. The banner should have been out. But what does it say next? So Moses spoke thus to the children of Israel, but they did not heed Moses because of the anguish of spirit. And cruel bondage in one sense you could say it's astonishing isn't it that we have to be reprimanded to to praise God Um, I mean we don't find it hard to praise the things of this world Um, one of the things that um, Catherine and I do when we go on holiday is find the local Weatherspoons you know cheap grub a good price, and sometimes, not always, but sometimes in a nice setting if you go at the right time of the day, often an ex-old cinema or an old, even a chapel, there's a nice chapel in folks and you can sit in the pulpit still there. It does feel a bit strange eating a meal in such a place, but be that as it may, it's a nice environment to sit. And I remember when we found, if you ever go in Ramsgate, I'm, t- I'm selling it now, there's, a, there's an amazing one in Ramsgate. It's like being on the Titanic. It's just a beautiful, beautiful place and it's overlooking the sea and you're in there. And what's the first thing I do? I ring my parents because they also like to do this. And I say... You've got to come to the one in, in, in Ramsgate. And I, and I compel them by way of persuasion. These things are so good. We don't find it e- difficult to, to stir up and praise the things of this world, do we? It comes naturally. But to praise his holy name? I mean, there's nothing more worthy of praise. There's no more object worthy of praise as the Lord, who is incomparable in his, in his excellences, his nature. He's unrivaled in his works and his accomplishments. Works of creation. Can we not praise him for his works of creation? Work of salvation, plan of redemption. Who has manifested his attributes in the gospel of his son. Of mercy, love and grace, unsearchable wisdom. And yet despite all this, we find it hard to praise God. Why? And the answer to that is painful but simple. The flesh. The flesh. Don't you just hate the flesh? Galatians 5 verse 17 says, For the flesh lusts against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary to one another, so that you do not do the things that you wish. So whenever we go to, you go to watch the cricket at Edgebaston, there's no, there's no flesh trying to stop you from enjoying that. Your flesh is enjoying it. Um, when you put Wimbledon on the television, your flesh is not fighting against it. You, you must not enjoy this. Or, you know, it's easy because these, these are things of the world. Our flesh is, is comfortable with these things. But when we draw near to God, the flesh says, no. No. Now, as a Christian, you say, well, haven't I been delivered? Well, yes and no. The flesh has been mortally wounded in the sense that the flesh is now no longer the dominating party uh, that controls you. But be that as it may, whilst you're in this body, the flesh 
though fatally wounded, is not dead. Paul describes that, doesn't he, in Romans 7. When I would do good, evil is there beside me. I think I've said this before, but isn't it, isn't it terrifying? The kind of thoughts that can come into our minds in the house of God, at communion. Um, it's astounding, but that's the flesh. The flesh. And dear friends, if you didn't have that tension... You wouldn't be a Christian. The mark of a true believer is not that you feel like worshipping God all the time, but is that you have a desire to worship God even when you don't feel like it. And the flesh would pull you away. The very fact that David says, bless, three times shows you it's a battle. It's like he says, bless, and his soul says no. So he says, bless, and the soul says no. Bless the Lord. And then he gets specific and forget not all his benefits. He will not let the flesh win. The second thing we see here is that we are encouraged to praise God. I want you to see the very fact that David in the psalm teaches us how to find a way out of spiritual slumber and misery and depression. Is that praise is the place where godly affections are fostered. David is showing us here, and God has preserved this to show you there's a way out. There is a way out. The Lord has promised to bless us when we bless him. Oh, my soul and all that is within me, here is a man who says, I will not settle for this. I will stir myself up. Maybe this is what the hymn writer had in mind when he penned the words, Oh, for a closer walk with God, a calm and heavenly frame, a light to shine upon the road that leads me to the Lamb. Where is the blessedness I once knew when I first saw the Lord? Where is the soul, the refreshing view of Jesus and his word? What peaceful hours I once enjoyed. How sweet their memory still, but they have left an aching void the world can ever fill. And again, just to assure you that you're a Christian, if you have a longing in your heart for the Lord, you can't long for what you've never experienced. You can't desire what you've never known. The sense of void you feel means it's once been filled. And so this is, a, this is the mark of a, of a believing man or a believing woman. That longing for God. Who put that there? Where has that come from? And if you're mourning your loss of God, be encouraged. You, you, the Lord is showing you here. Here's the way back to find him. It is to stir yourself up to praise God. David would say to you, this is the way out. Now what's interesting is, he concludes the psalm at the end of it all, having surveyed all God's dealings with him. In verse 20, he's now so full of the Lord, he's now found a way out of where he was, that he's now exhorting other people and other, other beings and other realities. To Bless the Lord, all you his angels. Uh, Bless the Lord, all you his hosts. He's saying, you've got to do this. You don't know what you're missing out on. Bless the Lord. So be encouraged then to pray, praise the Lord. There's no sickness, there's no, there's no suffering in, staying, in, in going to God. The, the way to God is to go to God. <laughs> Thirdly, see, we are to be always praising God. David doesn't give us a particular time when he praises the Lord. He um, doesn't say, praise the Lord, O my soul, when you are happy. Um, praise the Lord, O my soul, when you've had a good week. Praise my soul, O oh the Lord, when you've had good sleep. Praise, praise the Lord, O oh my soul, when you're less busy. No, praise the Lord, O oh my soul, and all that is within me. There's no change of circumstances from Psalm 102 to Psalm 103. Because here's the point. It is not circumstances we worship, is it? It is the Lord. And the Lord doesn't change. I, the Lord, do not change change i am the same yesterday today and forever so as long as god is who he is and who he said he is then you have an object of praise you have someone and something to praise is that not what job said when he said though he slay me yet will i praise him but the the, the fundamental thing he does here is he says forget not his benefits the greatest danger you have is forgetfulness. Now, by forgetfulness, I don't mean that you intellectually forget the truth that you know. You'd have to be very sick to do that. 
By forgetfulness, the scriptures don't mean that you forget certain things are true and certain things have happened, but they lose their freshness. You forget how amazing they are. You forget the wonder of it all, the wonder of who God is, the wonder of what Jesus Christ has done on the cross. You, you stop enjoying it. You stop marveling it. That's what he means by forget not his benefits. Forget not the benefits. You always have them. You know that you have them, but you have ceased to enjoy them and, and marvel in them. That is what it is to forget. It's like an opened bottle of Coke in the fridge. And then you come to it four days later and it's gone flat. You have the truths. You, you, you possess them. But they've gone flat in your mind. They're no, they're no less amazing than they are. And what David is saying here is, if we were to remember all his benefits, and he goes on to describe them, we would have no basis upon which to moan. So then, fourthly, we are given reasons to praise God. We are given reasons to praise God. Verses uh, 2, uh, verse 3, sorry, and onwards. Who forgives all your iniquities, who heals all your diseases. He brings you back to the basics of what it is to be a believer. And the primary blessing he sets forth is the blessing of forgiveness. And again, we can become so familiar with that word. But my dear friends, this is an astounding statement. And I, and I can only state it, but pray the Spirit would make it fresh to you. Friends, even if we had never sinned, right? Even if we had lived perfectly and uprightly, there would still be an infinite gap between God and us as creatures, for God to deal with us in any way, even if we were sinless, for God to, to even bless us with any gift would be tremendous grace and mercy and condescending love for an infinitely holy God to have anything to do with creatures. Even unfallen creatures would be undeserved. That's why I get a bit uneasy when theologians want to say that the covenant with Adam was solely a covenant of works. Well, indeed, it was a covenant of works. I'm not here to dispute that. But it was still gracious. It was still gracious of God to say to Adam, I have given you every good tree in the garden to eat and to enjoy. And if, if, you, do not, if you pass this test and you refuse to eat from the tree of knowledge of good and evil, that one tree, then you will have life. Though it was a covenant of works and that the only way he could enjoy those blessings was through obedience, it was still gracious of God to even offer this, this man anything. But, but what, what David's saying here is that God's dealings with us at their very roots are summed up in forgiveness. The, the, the Lord has forgiven us all our iniquities. Now that word iniquities in the Hebrew is a very powerful word. It speaks of twisted, corrupt, perverse behaviour. And so David is acknowledging then his corruption and he is saying, the Lord has forgiven me all of my perversity. Entirely forgiven. Not just some. Not just a little bit. David is saying all of it. And if you're David, that means Bathsheba. And think about that. The sin there was not just the adultery, was it? He had a man murdered. And, and, and not just one man murdered. Many men, when Joab was put to the front so that he would be killed, many men died with Joab. There were many grieving widows in Israel because of David. And yet David could say, I'll tell you what, whatever I'm going through, as he's described in Psalm 102, I can praise the Lord for this. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits, for he forgives all my iniquities, past, present, and future. He goes on to illustrate it in verse 12. As far as the, I don't know, I haven't got a compass actually to know where we are, but uh, the east is from the west. So far has he removed our transgressions from us. So if I tell Hugh to walk west and Andrew to walk east, are they ever going to meet? They're never going to meet. 
to walk east and west is to walk in opposite directions, and to keep going would be to get completely far. You'd never meet. And what David is saying, he has put my sins, he's put me on one direction and my sins on the other. We will never meet ever again. Isn't that good news? He's saying, my sins will never, ever find me out. When God looks at us, he sees our sin on a completely different horizon. He has justified us. And what I also love here in the original language is, and it com- is conveyed in our version, is that this is a present tense. Maybe some of you need to know, that, to know this tonight. Who still forgives all your iniquities. Maybe some of you, someone here needs to know that. He, he still forgives. Even this evening, he forgives. Maybe you're caught up in besetting sin. He still forgives. Now, my dear friends, whatever you are going through, can you not praise God for this? What can you experience in this life that's so bad that would mean you should not praise God for his forgiveness, for his forgiving grace? There are angels, fallen angels, who can never know this forgiveness. There are multitudes and multitudes in the valley of decision who have not known this forgiveness. There are those not of his flock whose sins abide on them. And one day, one day, they really and truly will have to give an account and pay. But you're forgiven. You are forgiven. Why such grace to you? What made you to differ? The Lord could have passed you over. And would have been just to have done so. But he hasn't. Or imagine, so you don't, you're, you're struggling with your life and your circumstances, but imagine you had your ideal circumstances but were not forgiven. Would you swap places? I asked you that question this evening. It's a very searching question. Would you have all the world, if not Christ? How would you answer that question? If you can say from the depths of your soul, no, God helping me. <laughs> Amen, you are a Christian. You are a child of God. David is being taken up here then with the wonder of redeeming grace. The second thing he praises God for, the second benefit is healing. Oh, where's pastor going now? (laughs) Verse 3, who heals all your diseases and depending on your background you might have a bit of a nervousness about what I, about this point, he heals all your diseases. But is it not true that you and I have been physically healed of many diseases? That's true, isn't it? Who 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 gave the doctors and the medicines to? Who who gave the brains to these people to discover these things? I mean, every single piece of. Do you ever take a medicine? If you suffer headache, suffer like me, you know. You called it a magic pill to me in the week, didn't you? That the, the summer trip done. You know, you take your magic pill. I often think, what would my life be like without them? It often terrifies me when I look on the packets and I see that a lot of these things come from other countries. And I think, well, what if there was a trade embargo or there was a trade war out of the sea and these things couldn't get here? We suddenly realise how dependent we are on these things. These things we take for granted. You see, some people just want to make, the, want to spiritualise this, and indeed I will. It has a spiritual purpose, but they, but we mustn't forget. That God does daily load us with benefits. He heals us of all our diseases. Not completely, not entirely, or none of us would die, of course. We are ageing and decaying, and, and diseases will, in the end, get the better of us. But he's also secured our bodily healing, hasn't he? You know, A lot of these health and wealth preachers that preach that he's secured healing for you in the atonement. So many reformed people are so, so afraid of what is a, a wrong emphasis, but it is true to say he's secured a t- our healing in the atonement. But it's not been applied yet. <laughs> That's the point. These false teachers say you can be, you are secure, healing is secured for you bodily now. To which we say, no, not yet. That day is coming when I receive my resurrection body. But we can say by faith with David, I will be delivered from this body of sin. He heals my diseases. But of course, there's spiritual healing here. You know, every trial you go through, Christian, every um, difficult time, do you know what the Lord's doing? He's healing you of your diseases. 
He's healing me. He's, 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 he's putting straight what is crooked. He's sorting us out. He, he's taking out that which is diseased and, and broken by the fall and by, by sin. Again, can we not praise God? Does any of this depend on our circumstances? In fact, our circumstances may be the very evidence that we know and experience these things. I can bless God when he's dealing with me, that he's restoring me into his image. This brings us sweetness, doesn't it, into every affliction. The third thing he puts before his remembrance is redemption. Who redeems your life from destruction. I love the word redemption because forgiveness, all of these words convey different aspects of the gospel. But redemption conveys the fact that we belong to God. That we are his. There you were in the slave market. In your sin and misery. And Christ as he was going up the line. Purchased you. And has taken you home with him. You, you belong to the Lord. They shall be mine says the Lord of hosts. On the day that I make them my jewels. And if you're his. And if you're redeemed by him. You, you cannot be lost. You're protected. You're provided for. He's a good master. He's a gracious master. He's a loving saviour. And it's true that to say that not only have we been redeemed in the objective and ultimate sense, we are daily being redeemed from many a danger. David, often, David said, didn't he, as, as for me there is but a step between me and death. And yet time and time and time again, uh, David was delivered from danger. And friends, if we could see if you and I could have our eyes opened to see the dangers that God has delivered us from. You, you think the temptations you're struggling with are the half of it. The Lord has preserved you from far more. If the Lord was to allow you to face all the temptation you could face, we would be overwhelmed. But the Lord allots to us only what is right and what is carefully put to us. The fourth benefit is privilege. This is a wonderful point. Who crowns you with loving kindness and tender mercies. Now, to be crowned is to be a prince. Do you know that? You are princes. A king gives his princes, you know, we have the Prince of Wales, and the idea is, Wales, you, you're responsible for Wales. You're a prince, it means what's happened is Christ is the king of kings. He possesses all things. But he has now bestowed upon us the privileges of his kingdom. The blessings of his reign. And so, what are those privileges? What are those blessings? Well, we're told, loving kindness and, and tender mercies. And again, it takes faith to be able to, in, to, to get it, to, to enter into the reality of this. But what we can say is, whatever I'm going through, whatever I will go through, I can only expect one thing in my life. Loving kindness. Covenant faithfulness. Covenant love. Covenant commitment. My God will never forsake me. Every experience, every valley, every trial, it will all be loving kindness his mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. You see, because the Lord Jesus had a crown of thorns, you can wear a crown of blessing. And you can wake up every day knowing God is being faithful to his word. He's tender as well as almighty. He who holds the universe in the span of his hand and can gather the oceans into a heap. He is your God. And he pities you as a father pities his child. That has nothing to do with your circumstances, does it? Again. The fifth blessing, coming to close soon, is renewal in weakness. Who satisfies your mouth with good things. So that your youth is renewed like the eagle. Now commentators have a little bit of infighting about what this phrase mouth is. Um, the literal um, Hebrew word is translated as ornament. And it seems, the older commentators seem to get to the essence of it. Who satisfies your ornament. An ornament in these days, not many people would have had much, would have been your prized possession. 
So what the older commentators, Gill and Spurgeon, pointed out was that the Lord satisfies the chiefest and most precious thing we have with good things. What is that? What is your most prized possession? Your soul. Your soul. So you could translate it, who satisfies your soul with good things so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. Eagles, what makes eagles unique is eagles retain their vigour and their vitality to old age. And they are the most fearless, the most majestic, soaring above the storms in the scorching sun. And David can say that by faith, the Lord will continually give vitality and refreshment and provision to my soul. And that is a promise for you older ones, dear friends. What a blessed promise. The outward man, Paul said, is perishing. I mean, some of you are just collapsing, aren't you? You're falling apart. I'm not, I'm not saying that because I'm, I'm just... You tell me that, I'm just telling you what you tell me. I'm not suggesting that's how I view you. I actually think some of you are absolute heroes. I mean, there's Ken there on Friday with his handing out tracts. There's June there sitting on the chair. I mean, what, what, where would you find that? But some of you are disintegrating. And yet here is a promise that though the outward man is perishing, the inward man is being renewed day by day. The world might cast you off as past a sell-by date, but not the Lord. The Lord's not done with you. The Lord is still dealing you. The Lord is still blessing you. The Lord is still tending you. The Lord is still caring for you. The Lord is still loving you. The Lord is still blessing you. And so with Joel, we can say, let the weak say, I am strong. As your days, so shall be your strength. I want to say to you, why would he strengthen your soul if he didn't have a work for your soul to do? He, he, God doesn't do things randomly. He's purposeful in all that he does. And whilst you have breath then, the Lord has a work for you to do. I think I, I have told you this story before, but, it, but it's, one, it's, a, it's a story that's so worth repeating because it's so encouraging. I was at Bible college and a pastor was coming giving us a lecture on, on how to encourage elderly saints. And uh, there was this blind elderly woman in his congregation. And he just preached a rousing sermon to try and get people to do stuff in the church. One of those ones you know, to make you feel guilty. And she comes up to him at the end and she says, but, but, but what can I do? And wisely he said, seek the Lord, pray about it, and he will show you what to do. Well, the next thing he heard about what she had been doing was when people started coming with her to chapel. What she had been doing is she'd been using her blindness to her advantage. She used to sit on the seafront, hold a tract in her hand, and whenever she felt the presence of someone sitting next to her, she would say, I'm blind, can you read this to me? And I apparently, I can't remember the specific numbers, but over the course of a, a summer, she brought a good number of people. Vitality in her soul, you see. Her body was perishing, her eyes were perishing, she couldn't see. And she felt humanly, what can I do? But the Lord was renewing her youth like the eagle so that she was successful as an evangelist more than any of the younger ones in the church. You have, praise to cause, to, you have cause to praise God this evening, dear friends. And even the unbeliever, and uh, people that don't believe in the free offer would not like what I'm saying tonight. But the unbeliever should and can praise God in this, in this sense. You should praise God that there's a way still open for you. You should praise God the door has not yet shut. You should praise God that the Lord's mercy is available to you. You should praise God that he casts out none. You, you should come to God for salvation, praising God as you come. Christ still forgives, Christ still heals, Christ still redeems. Your first prayer could be, I thank you, Lord, that you've not swallowed me up. Save me and I will be yours. So then, I'm not saying it's automatic now and that you all feel good. Um, but I pray that's been instructive. Don't settle for how you feel. Stir yourselves up, reprimand yourselves. If you wait until you get better, you will never get better at all. Go to God, praise God, you know, and don't stop seeking him till you find him. Draw near to God and he will draw near 
to you. And may we have a season as a church, wouldn't it be lovely, where we just sensed in one another, just you know, a blessed season, that there's a rediscovered vitality in the things of God, a renewed appreciation and sense. That's what revival is, really. Revival is, is, is really when the things of the gospel, the, the things of the saviour, they, they, they suddenly come alive in our consciences and minds again, as, as if we've been converted all over again. Have you had that feeling before, what it is to feel like you've been converted all over again? That's, that's, what, that's what David is longing for here. May, may we also know what David knew. Well, let's pray.